Hi guys. <clears throat> it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, over the top, beautiful day. Here in the collapse of global industrial civilization, here on this gorgeous but chilly last summer Sunday of 2020, where we had another freeze last night here at Bugs in a Jar Farm outside of Ithaca, New York. But it is now a lovely Sunday, <clears throat> and I need to go check on uh, the chainsawing of firewood going on down the street here. But before I do, I'm just going to bring you today's Chronicle of the Collapse. Oh yes, uh, this is Collapse Chronicles. I am Sam Mitchell. This is my little co-pilot, Sancho Panza. <clears throat> And I am sorry that I cannot remember the name of the alert <clears throat> uh, viewer who sent me this article that came out a few months ago on Counterpunch, actually. No, it was, it came out in the middle of the height of the Corona panic when Collapse Chronicles was going on hiatus for a few weeks, so uh, did not bring it out then, but uh, now that the planet has a few other things to talk about, we're going to get back into this excellent essay <clears throat> by a fellow named Craig Collins. Uh, Craig Collins is a environmental law professor at uh, UCLA, I believe. So anyway, uh, Craig Collins wants to tell us about the four reasons civilization will not decline, it will collapse. <clears throat> Anybody not understanding the difference between decline and collapse. Uh, this is how Craig explained it in the opening salvo of the Corona Panic. Take it away. <clears throat> As modern civilization's shelf life expires, more scholars have turned their attention to the decline and fall of civilization's past. Their studies have generated rival explanations of why societies collapse and civilizations die. Meanwhile, a lucrative market has emerged for post-apocalyptic novels, movies, TV shows, and video games for those who enjoy the vicarious thrill of dark, futuristic disaster and mayhem from the comfort of their cozy couch. Of course, surviving the real thing will become a much different story. The latent fear that civilization is living on borrowed time has also spawned a counter market of happily ever after optimists who desperately cling to their belief in endless progress. Popular Pollyannas like cognitive psychologist Steven Pinker provide this anxious crowd with soothing assurances that the titanic ship of progress is unsinkable. Pinker's publications have made him the high priest of progress. While civilization circles the drain, his ardent audiences find comfort in lectures and brooks brimming with cherry-picked evidence to prove that life is better than ever mm -hmm. and will surely keep improving. Yet, when questioned, Pinker himself admits, quote, it is incorrect to extrapolate that the fact that we have made progress is a prediction that we are guaranteed to make progress." Close quote. P. 
Peeker's rosy statistics cleverly disguise the fatal flaw in his argument. <clears throat> the progress of the past was built by sacrificing the future, and the future is upon us. All those happy facts he cites about living standards, life expectancy, and economic growth are the product of an industrial civilization that has pillaged and polluted this planet to produce temporary progress for a growing middle class and enormous profits and power for a tiny elite. Not everyone who understands that progress has been purchased at the expense of the future thinks that civilization's collapse will be abrupt and bitter. Scholars of ancient societies like Jared Diamond and John Michael Greer accurately point out that abrupt collapse is a rare historical phenomenon. In the long descent, Greer assures his readers that, quote, the same pattern repeats over and over again in history, gradual disintegration, not sudden catastrophic collapse, is the way civilizations end." Close quote. Greer estimates that it takes, on average, about 250 years for civilizations to decline and fall, and he finds no reason why modern civilization should not follow this, quote, usual timeline. But Greer's assumption is built on shaky ground because industrial civilization differs from all past civilizations in four crucial ways, and every one of them may accelerate and intensify the coming collapse while increasing the difficulty of recovery. So this is four reasons why John Michael Greer and Jared Diamond uh, are a little bit too optimistic even in their dark predictions for the gradual decline and fall of this civilization. Okay. Difference number one. Unlike all previous civilizations, modern industrial civilization is powered by an exceptionally rich, non-renewable, and irreplaceable energy source. Can you say fossil fuels? This unique energy base predisposes industrial civilization to a short, meteoric lifespan of unprecedented boom and drastic bust. Megacities, globalized production, industrial agriculture, and a human population approaching 8 billion are all historically exceptional and unsustainable with out fossil fuels. Today, the rich, easily exploited oil fields and coal mines of the past are mostly depleted, and while there are energy alternatives, there are no realistic replacements that can deliver the abundant net energy fossil fuels once provided. Our complex expansive, high-speed civilization owes its brief lifespan to this one-time, rapidly diminishing energy bonanza. <coughs> 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 
Okay. Difference number two. <clears throat> Unlike past civilizations, the economy of industrial society is capitalist. Production for profit is its prime directive and driving force. The unprecedented surplus energy supplied by fossil fuels has generated exceptional growth and enormous profits over the past two centuries. But in the coming decades, these historic windfalls of abundant energy, constant growth, and rising profits will vanish. However, unless it is abolished, which, yeah, dream on, unless it is abolished, capitalism will not disappear when boom turns to bust. Instead, energy-starved, growthless capitalism will turn catabolic. Catabolism or catabolism refers to the condition whereby a living thing devours itself, like Sancho Panza seems to be trying to do during this rant, my little catabolic doomer dog. All right. Catabolism refers to the condition whereby a living thing devours itself as profitable sources of production dry up, capitalism will be compelled to turn a profit by consuming the social assets it once created by cannibalizing itself. The profit motive will exacerbate industrial society's dramatic decline. Catabolic capitalism will profit from scarcity, crisis, disaster, and conflict, warfare, resource hoarding, ecological disaster, and pandemic diseases will become the big profit makers. Ha! Huh. This was probably written, it came out on March 13th, this prediction about making a profit off of, uh, off of pandemics. Probably written, I'm guessing, may, maybe in January of 2020. Can we, if anybody who does not understand how to make profit off of a pandemic, uh, go on Amazon.com and put in the word masks. All right. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Capital will, fl will flow toward lucrative ventures like cybercrime, predatory lending, and financial fraud bribery, corruption, and racketeering, weapons, drugs, and human trafficking. Once disintegration and destruction become the primary source of profit, catabolic capitalism will rampage down the road to ruin, gorging itself on one self-inflicted disaster after another. And then all through this, he, uh, he gives references. Uh, I, I'm going to put the link to here, so if you want to dig deeper into this, <clears throat> Craig cites uh, a bunch of references for this essay. Okay, moving on to difference number three. Unlike past societies, industrial civilization is not Roman, Chinese, Egyptian, Aztec, or Mayan. Modern civilization is human, 
planetary and, above all, ecocidal pre-industrial civilizations depleted their topsoil, fell their forest, and polluted their rivers, but the harm was far more temporary and geographically limited. Once market incentives harnessed the colossal power of fossil fuels to exploit nature, the dire results were planetary. Two centuries of fossil fuel combustion have saturated our biosphere with climate-altering carbon that will continue wreaking havoc for generations to come, assuming there are plural generations to come. Why are you being such a little wiggle worm? Fine. The little dog just cannot stand it. All right. Go get that bug or that mousey or whatever it is you're chasing. He's got some rodent uh, cornered under the kitchen sink. Okay. <clears throat> the damage to Earth's living systems, the circulation and chemical composition of our atmosphere and the ocean, the stability of hydrological and biogeochemical cycles, and the biodiversity of our entire planet is essentially permanent. Humans have become the most invasive species ever known. Although we are a mere 0.01% of the planet's biomass, our domestic crops and livestock dominate life on Earth. In terms of total biomass, 96% of all the mammals on Earth are livestock, while only 4% are wild mammals, 70% of all birds are domesticated poultry, while only 30% of birds are wild. About half of the Earth's wild animals are thought to have been lost in the last 50 years. Of course, that, is, that number has been raised to approximately 70%. Scientists estimate that half of all remaining species will be extinct by the end of the century. There are no more unspoiled ecosystems or new frontiers where people can escape the damage they have caused and recover from collapse. Okay, let's look at difference number four. Human civilization's collective capacity to confront its mounting crises is crippled by a fragmented political system of antagonistic nations ruled by corrupt elites who care more about their power and wealth than people and the planet. Humanity now faces a perfect storm of converging global calamities. Intersecting tribulations like climate chaos, rampant extinction, food and freshwater scarcity, poverty, extreme inequality, and the rise of global pandemics are rapidly eroding the foundations of modern life. Yet, this fractious and fractured political systems makes organizing and mounting a cooperative response nearly impossible. And the more that catabolic industrial capitalism becomes, the greater the danger that hostile rulers will fan the flames of nationalism and go to war over scarce resources. Of course, 
warfare is not new, but modern warfare is so devastating, destructive, and toxic that little would remain in its aftermath. This would be the final nail in civilization's coffin. And so now I don't know if we're going to have any hopium here or not. As Craig asked the questions, question rising from the ruins, how people respond to the collapse of industrial civilization will determine how bad things get and what will replace it. The challenges are monumental. They will force us to question our identities, our values, and our loyalties like no other experience in human history. Who are we? Are we first and foremost human beings struggling to raise our families, strengthen our communities, and coexist with the other inhabitants of Earth? Or do our primary loyalties belong to our nation, our culture, our race, our ideology, or our religion? Can we put the survival of our species and our planet first, or will we allow ourselves to become hopelessly divided along national, cultural, racial, religious, or party lines? And I think we all know the answer to that question, Craig, as you do yourself. The eventual outcome of this great implosion is up for grabs. Will we overcome denial and despair, kick our addiction to petroleum, and pull together to break the grip of corporate power over our lives? Can we foster genuine democracy, harness renewable energy, reweave our communities, relearn forgotten skills, and heal the wounds we have inflicted on the earth? Or will fear and prejudice drive us into hostile camps fighting over the dwindling resources of a degraded planet? The stakes could not be higher. There you go. Thank you, Craig Collins, PhD. Uh, he is the author of Toxic Loopholes, which examines America's dysfunctional system of environmental protection. Yes. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, and that brings us to the close of today's cheery, spot-on uh, chronicle of the collapse. So if you like what Brother Craig uh, had to say to you about how doomed we are, please uh, give him some love by giving some thumbs up to this video. I will put the link on here so you can you know, go to all of his notes and get deeper and deeper to this. And uh, if you want to subscribe to more in this doom and gloom while you're over here, hop on board. And I really do appreciate the tiny few people who have uh, ever supported whatever it is that I do on YouTube. Because I really don't know why I do this. I just think that the single biggest story in the history of humanity is more interesting than uh, fill in your own blanks. And with that, I gotta go check the progress of the chainsawing for firewood as we head into another frosty night. 
and tomorrow being the last day of summer 2020, so you better get out there and enjoy summer 2020 while you still can because the fall of 2020 sweeps in on Tuesday and it's going to be a humdinger the fall of 2020. You can bet your boots on that one. Bye guys. Okay, are you happy? What were you so jumpy about? It's about, I'm tired of your ranting. I've had enough of it. With all your doom and gloom. I'm sick of it. I'm going to go get a mousey like that. I'm going to get the mousey. Where's the mousey? Where's that mousey? So, I think the mousey might be in the garage like that.